Today's speaker is obviously one of our own, uh, Dr. Noemi al -Hatab. So you can start whenever, Noemi. I'm starting right now. No, not right now, because I can't figure out how to share. OK. Is it just working? Oh, it's not working. Can you guys see this? Yes. Yes. You can see it. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, and uh, just because we're with friends and family, if you guys want to interrupt me at any time, don't raise your hand with Zoom, because I'm going to not see it, but just holler, I guess. Um, should I start? OK, wonderful. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to get to talk to you about some of the work we're doing in the lab. This is work with uh, Inigo Orteaga, Kathy Lee, and Chris Wiggins, who are in applied math. And I'm not sure if they're here today. I see Chris, and I see maybe others. Uh, but if they are, um, thanks for coming. So. I don't have any conflict or interest to report. So I just before I, I jump into this particular topic, I just wanted to um, tell you a tiny bit about each of the projects that I'm doing right now with all of my students. The first one is about uh, patient record summarization from EHR documentation. This has been a very long-standing project. And with every student, we change a little bit the, the focus. Uh, this ongoing work is with Griffin Adams, and he is looking in particular at summarizing the brief hospital course. So this is a, a purely natural language processing and natural language generation pro pro project, where within one admission, there's a lot of documentation. Uh, and so typically a provider would write the discharge summary and there's a section in there that's explaining everything that happened during the, the admission and it's called the brief hospital course and it's a heavy duty synthesis right like that goes from um, tens of um, of notes into a five sentence paragraph and so we're trying to help physicians write this particular section because what we've noticed from asking our colleagues and looking at a large corpus of those is that there are uh, huge variation in quality of this brief hospital summarization, brief hospital course uh, paragraphs. The second, um, the second type of project I work on is, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Can you hear me? I hear a lot of, okay. Um, the second project that uh, people in the lab are working on, uh, this is primarily work from Adrian Pichon and uh, others is looking at uh, the fact that patients uh, work, literally work with uh, their clinicians when they want to manage your chronic diseases. And so if we had to build a personal health library for patients, what would it look like and how would what type of data would we want to add into it and what part of this personal health library should be made available to clinicians. Uh, this is part of a project funded by NLM and uh, Sue Bakken and Lina, Lina Mamakina are parts of it. The third one, uh, we just submitted a paper on Friday on this question, uh, which is uh, also part of a managing of chronic diseases. And the question here is that, you know, we, when patient has a chronic disease, often there would be uh, self-management that is suggested to patients, but going from a uh, generic recommendation to actually implementing the self-management regimen into someone's daily life is quite difficult and there's a lot of burden on patients. And so the, the question we're trying to ask here is if we have um, a way to interact day to day with a patient where we can suggest things to them and they can tell us if these things have worked and they can also tell us about how well they're doing that day, maybe we could think of um, tools that are automated that suggest uh, self-management strategies, but also learn as they suggest for the best uh, sequence of self-management strategies for that particular individual. And so for the machine learning people in the audience, what, what I'm describing really sounds like reinforcement learning. And so what are, you know, the, the question we're at right now is, there's a lot of advances in reinforcement learning, 
in the general field. There's a lot of knowledge about self-management strategies in the informatics and behavioral field. How can we combine the two? And is it even possible to, you know, what are the lower bounds of feasibility for an algorithm to learn from a single individual? Uh, and so what we're finding is that it seems like it could be possible, but now we have to do the hard work of actually uh, training such uh, tools. Okay, so that's kind of a very uh, quick worldwide tour of the lab. And you'll notice that I'm not talking about anything disparity wise, because I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I think Tony is gonna talk very soon about his work and Harry is also supposed to talk very soon. So I thought I wouldn't mention any of their work. Um, Okay, so I'm going to move on to predictive modeling from self-tracking apps, and I'm going to be using menstrual health as a particular example we're looking at. So what do we know about the menstrual cycle? Most of what we know is from this paper, which is from, uh, I think, 1967. It's referred to as a trailer paper, and it's the first one that uh, figures out what are the variations in uh, cycle lengths throughout uh, reproductive life of people, so from puberty towards menopause. And the way they do this is they asked people to write into their diary throughout their lives the dates of their different uh, menstrual cycle. It was one of the first kind of like uh, large, large scale type of uh, data. Um, and so in 1967, it got published and we're going back about 30 years back is when people were actually being part of, a, about, of this uh, study. And so all of what we know about menstruation comes from this paper, which basically means all of what we know comes from like the 40s and 50s of last century. Uh, this paper, which just came out in 2020, uh, is a review from uh, all of what we know right now in menstruation, and we can put all of that into a short paper. Uh, and it's published by a job, but the really the, the main point of the paper is that we don't know much. Uh, women's health concerns are generally underrepresented, but reproductive health in particular has been hampered by lack of understanding of basic uterine and menstrual physiology. Um, you know, as, as this is happening in the clinical world, there's, a, there's been kind of a moment about menstruation uh, there's been a lot of work about how it's understudied, stigmatized, misunderstood, uh, but we also know that it is important to study it because it is linked to many aspects of uh, a menstruator's life, such as their mental, social, physical well-being. Uh, and we also know that there's some uh, diseases out there that are linked to the menstrual cycle, but we don't know um, exactly what are the interactions between them. I'm putting here on the side a uh, Pantone card. Pantone is an organization that decides what are the cool colors out there on a daily, on a yearly fashion. And, um, you know, I, we put it there because it's kind of a, it's a, what is happening right now about normalization of this uh, uh, phenomenon of menstruation. And so there was this uh, new color of shade of red uh, that Pantone decided to call period. Uh, turns out it was a big fiasco. There was a lot of controversy about it because some people said, well, that's just not okay to have a single shade of red. That's uh, not representative of all the different ways in which people menstruate. There was also some, um, a lot of uh, clashback about the fact that this was actually not an anatomically correct uterus with a menstrual cup inside the uterus. So lots of problems, but nevertheless, there is a moment right now where um, there's more and more acceptance about talking about menstruation. I want to put out a, a call for Adrian's latest paper in, um, in Jamia, which uh, looks at what, is, what do we know about uh, menstrual tracking and what do we know about the people who would want to use menstrual tracking, which we call menstruators. And we're not the ones who are making up this term. It's a term that's been used since the 50s. And uh, what you're seeing here is a review of the literature from everything that talks about menstruators. Um, and our point is that it's exponentially uh, getting bigger. Um, and 
the other point is that it's really being talked about from many different aspects, from the bi biological to technological and legal. Um, I see a chat question. Let me look at it. Oh, no, it's just a yay, Adrian. Very good. <laughs> um, the other point of this uh, of this paper is that these are some of the icons of the most uh, um, prevalent menstrual tracking apps on uh, app stores and Google and, and iTunes. And you'll notice that there's a few patterns here, but mostly that there's a lot of pink. Uh, and so on one hand, we have the research that is being more and more um, uh, subtle and nuanced about the different types of menstruators and all of the different aspects of menstruation. But on the other hand, we have technology, which doesn't seem to be really catching up with this uh, diversity. So that's just one thing that I wanted to say. We, we put a lot of uh, really interesting, I think, uh, design implications from the work on menstruators review uh, into that paper, but I'm going to let, you know, Adriana had presented that at the retreat in September, so I'm not talking too much about this today. And these are some of our um, um, findings from the literature. Okay, so these apps, as, uh, as limited as they are, they are providing us with a very excellent opportunity because we can be uh, taking all of these data and, and treat it as an observational data uh, repository. So here I'm kind of uh, trying to convince you that uh, there is value in this observational data uh, from trackers. Most of the work in menstruation is extremely limited in size and time frame. So most of the menstruation papers out there are looking at, um, you know, maybe three to six months following uh, a very small amount of uh, menstruators. Um, they typically look at a very specific uh, issue such as, you know, ability to uh, exercise throughout the menstrual cycle. And the information is collected um, manually, meaning that people come to the lab and uh, do various things. Whereas from trackers, I, I don't have to uh, convince this particular audience, we're going to have a lot of data, it's going to be wide uh, in type of uh, data, data points. And uh, in the case of, of trackers for menstruation, we call them symptoms, even though they're not really symptoms, they're findings. Um, and you know, we also know that there's some limits to this type of observational data, such as the fact that they are maybe um, not as deep as what we would be collecting in a lab. But nevertheless, the scale of it is what's exciting here. So there is a lot of promise to this type of observational data. One is the one we're going to focus on today, which is can we predict some events uh, and that's very useful to menstruators, um, predicting your next period, but also for people who have uh, different symptoms throughout their menstrual cycle, predicting the next occurrence of the symptom is also of interest. There's also a lot of uh, question and, and need from individuals to understand their own data. So what I didn't tell you from the trailer paper, uh, which is going to become obvious as we start looking at, at some um, results later is that there is tremendous variation uh, from one individual to the other in terms of menstruation. And so it's, you know, that combined with the fact that there's still a little bit of stigma about talking about menstruation, individuals are basically on their own when it comes to understanding their physiology. And so having ways of reflecting over your data and learning from your data is particularly of interest in the case of menstruation. And then the, the third really big reason to be looking at these menstrual trackers is that um, because there's a lot of conditions that are linked to uh, disturbances in the menstrual cycle, we could use uh, this data to be able to perform early detection of disease. Any questions so far? I'm going to stop for a second. OK. Uh, so there's two points we're going to be making in, uh, in this work. The first one is that these type of uh, self-tracking data that come from app 
have a great potential, but there are some idiosyncrasies that we need to pay attention to when we're going to be characterizing the data and when we're going to be developing predictive models. Um, and these idiosyncrasies, we're going to call them biases or artifacts, but um, this is not uh, an uncommon thing when we deal with observational health data. I, I know all of you guys um, have encountered biases in clinical data, and it's exactly the same question here. Can we identify which biases exist in the data, and how can we mitigate for them? So we're going to have two uh, things that we talk about. The first one is a characterization task. The second one is a prediction task. Uh, the first one for characterization is we are going to take a large data set and we're going to be able to look at a particular question, which is the one of regularity. And I'll define uh, what that means. But really, we're looking for how do cycle length characteristics um, change, differ among groups of users? And how do you know what are when you look at these different groups, how are their tracking of symptoms different or similar? The second question for prediction is going to be looking at um, given a history of cycle that is tracked. So when I say cycle here, I really mean cycle length. Uh, and only using cycle uh, length information can we predict the next uh, cycle date. It's not a trivial task at all because uh, in addition to having variation from one individual to the next, there's also some uh, amount of variability within individuals. And then, as we said, we we're going to have to deal with some of the idiosyncrasies of mHealth data. And so one big question uh, that's going to be underlying this is, can we disentangle true cycle lengths from what we call self-tracking artifacts? that result from people sometimes tracking and sometimes forgetting to track. And finally, we'll hint at whether additional information, such as like what people track as far as symptoms, can help us predict uh, next site cycle lengths. So some of these uh, papers, the last two in here, are from colleagues. There's, there's starting to be more and more interest in uh, characterization of menstrual data. And these two papers, both in nat Nature Digital Medicine from 2019, are really interesting. Uh, and then the, two, the three papers on the top are from uh, our team. And they're looking at both the characterization and two about the predictions. OK, so the data we're using is from a partnership with a menstrual tracker, Clue. Um, for those of you who use it, it's, it's one of the most uh, popular menstrual trackers. There's about 12 million active users worldwide. And one reason we like to work with Clue is that they've been heavily reviewed by uh, different uh, associations, and it's considered uh, one of the few evidence-based a menstrual tracker out there. And so um, we like working with them. They also have a very rigorous science team within their startup. And so we've actually been literally collaborating with them uh, and writing papers together with them. Um, I'm showing here two uh, screenshots of the app. And basically, at each day, a user can feel free to uh, track whether they have their period, but also uh, here I'm showing uh, for pain, uh, what type of particular pain issue did they have, and there's a bunch of other, um, other symptoms that I'll describe later. It's, you know, it's not um, comprehensive, I would say. There's a lot of uh, discussion online and in papers about how this is not always representative of the type of pain, for example, that people have. But, you know, remember that there's, uh, this is, the goal here is to be as appealing to a large uh, body of, of people as possible. And so that kind of minimizes the number of things that someone can be tracking. Um, even though there's 12 million active users worldwide, when you start cutting down for particular types of users, it goes down very quickly. So, you know, lots of similarities again between clinical and, and self tracking data. Um, we're getting to really be studying in this case 
for this characterization paper, about 380,000 users. Um, and I'll describe to you in a minute why we're doing so, but it's still a, a large amount of data. Um, 380K users corresponding to nearly 5 million natural cycles. Um, there's the type of categories, when we say a symptom category, we mean uh, something like that, pain, uh, there's about 20 of them. And so what we see is that there's a lot of cycle, but there's also quite a lot of symptom, but not a ton of symptom tracking, about 170 million for these uh, 380K users. So let me talk first about the characterization. Any question, first of all? I wanna check in with everyone. Yeah, I, I was wondering about uh, the breakthrough bleeding and spotting and how those were dealt with in the analysis. Yeah, uh, I'll go back to this for a second. No, I can't go back. Yes, I can go back. Um, so, so you're right, there is one kind of a um, finding or symptoms that people can have, which is in the menstrual cycle, there's uh, the period part, but then as different hormones, um, change throughout the cycle, there sometimes is um, breakthrough bleeding. And so one big question when we have this type of data is what is a period and what is breakthrough bleeding? You know, there's definitely some pre-processing happening. So we worked actually quite a lot with Clue to define these things. Uh, and it's, you know, again, when you deal with like such a large amount of users, it's probably wrong for some, uh, but it's correct for most. Um, and so we had a we had a definition which was basically you know enough enough bleeding for enough days uh, is how it's considered. Any other questions? Yeah, that's a question. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering because you were saying how different hormones can trigger the trigger these findings, um, but this is an observational. Uh, tracking app, um, I'm sure it's really hard to know whether they actually are triggering those things. Will you be able to either do or uh, work with them do a validation study uh, trying to correlate those things, or are you able to possibly infer those things occurring? Yeah, it's a great question. I know everything that I'm going to be talking about today where we do not have any way to go back to the user and ask them, you know, did you did it really happen or not? So uh, everything we're doing is kind of uh, based on this data that we have. We have, well, I'll tell you at the end, I won't say it now, but <laughs> there's other things that we're trying. Uh, but for these papers, for sure, we're only looking at this data set and trying to look at the issues. But you're totally right, Nick, it's something that we would want to do ultimately. Um, so what's the issue? The real issue we're trying to figure out here is that um, these are all self-reports and that there could be uh, misreporting, there could be errors, and more importantly, there could be lack of user engagement. Um, lack of user engagement is a huge question in any um, active cell tracking type of app even though there's a lot of users and we'll, you'll see they're quite engaged, there's still a question about whether they're actually uh, consistently engaged with the app. And in fact, the lack of period tracking can distort cycle length information. So if I forget one cycle to track that I have my period, now it looks in the data like I have a very long period, a very long cycle. So um, this is an example of um, what we mean. So here we have, a longitudinal um, individual, and we have one cycle that has 30 days, one cycle of 27, and one of 35. This type of um, variability is totally normal and happens quite a lot. Here we have uh, four days reported of period, and it seems here like this user is quite regular in their period lengths. Um, and so the question is if here uh, this is skipped, you know. We now have a very long cycle, as, as you guys can imagine. So could we um, be able to detect this automatically, basically? Um, so one, one way, another way to look at this, I'm gonna move my Zoom thing. 
thing right here. Another way to look at this is to look is to do a histogram. And so here, what we're showing is um, this metric here is what we call the maximum absolute cycle length difference. So if I were to go back to my um, to my uh, example here, we have for each from one consecutive cycle uh, pair to the next, we can compute a cycle length difference. So here there is three days difference, uh, 16 days and five days different. And so now I have three metrics that explain this longitudinal data and I can compute a median and a max. In this case, my max is uh, 16 and my median is five. So when we, sorry, that's not the one I want to show. When we go and uh, do a histogram of our maximum absolute cycle length difference, we find that there's a lot of people that have, um, you know, there's this first peak here, which is basically telling us that uh, if I were to take this one, I'm going to assume that's like five days or so. That's what uh, the largest uh, bin of users is, and that means that the maximum difference, absolute difference from one cycle to the next was only five days across all of their cycles. And you notice that there's two peaks here, and these are typically not what you would find in this type of histogram. Um, and one is at 30 and one is at 60. And that to us is a very clear hint that there's a lot of users who uh, forgot for one, one cycle to uh, track, and in some cases forgot to track two different cycles. So how do we remediate this? We do something quite simple, but quite effective. We're going to introduce this uh, CLD, as we said, which is our own metric. That's not something that's been used in the literature before. And we're going to remove anything that has that uh, exceeds 10 days. OK, so we're going to say that if it takes more, um, if my maximum CLD is uh, more than 10 days, then that particular cycle is probably um, wrong and is due to having track, forgotten to track. And when we do this, when we remove those particular cycles from the same cohort of users, we actually end up getting, again, a very, uh, like some histogram that looks more like what we would think. So again, we're not removing users here. We're just saying, uh, you know, same type of users, but uh, in this case, you know, sorry, from here to here, same kind of users, 380 or so users. Uh, we identify potential cycles within their histories that look like they have been um, artificially inflated. And when we do that, we remove approximately 200,000 cycles. But what we see in this histogram is that it looks much more like what we would want to see in a histogram. So here is how we explain how we got to uh, this number of 380,000 people. Uh, we had um, we looked for the people who had uh, a natural cycle only. So a natural cycle means that throughout their history, they don't use any contraceptive. And we are looking at people who are between age 21 and 35. These are considered uh, stable years in reproductive uh, life. Uh, and then we remove a few things that don't make sense. Uh, user excluded cycle is a nice one. It's, uh, there is this ability in, in an app to say, just don't count this cycle towards my uh, normal history. Maybe I was pregnant or maybe something happened and users have uh, the ability to exclude those. Okay, so what are we finding when we look at this data, which is really the characterization task here? So. What we're doing is we're taking our uh, data set of 380,000 menstruators, and we're going to use this uh, um, cycle, sorry, this CLD uh, matrix. So that that guy here, this metric here, with median in this in this case, as a way to um, split and separate our data set. And in particular, we're going to be looking at anybody who has a CLD above nine days. What that means in English is that we're going to be looking at people for which half of their cycles is at, is at least nine days 
longer or shorter than the previous one. Um, we find that there's, and so we're going to call those irregular because there's a lot of variation in their cycle lengths. And the other ones we're going to call regular. So why did we choose nine? There, we, we did it in a data-driven way. We kind of looked at what was the median and we went for an elbow. But we also, uh, it was actually also nice because in the clinical literature, it said the guideline is basically, it's okay, it's totally normal to have irregular uh, or variation in cycle lengths, but anything over nine days could be something, could be hinting at something uh, into a person. And so go see your doctor if it's nine days. So it was kind of nice because we saw it both in the data and in not. So when we separate the, the data set this way, we find that about 10% of our users were what we called irregular. And I'm showing them here in uh, yellow and in blue I'm showing um, the, or green I'm showing the regular users. And what we're plotting here is a cycle length. So uh, what do we find? We find that for regular one, 90% of the population, basically uh, there is a very nice, um, a nice distribution here, and it kind of uh, peaks here at about 29 days, which is what's been shown in the literature. I know that um, the, the typical days around, uh, thrown around is 28 days for a cycle. Turns out uh, most of papers in recent years have said that, no, it's actually 29 days. Uh, and that's what we find in our data exactly. The 10% who are uh, irregular, they're you know, maybe also because they're irregular, they're varying, they vary so much. What we find is that their cycle length itself also is quite uh, different and sometimes very, very long. This is an example of uh, just two different users. And we're looking here at, um, you know, basically uh, how much does one uh, cycle length change from one to the next over pairs of three. And so the, the regular user, which is in green here, kind of stays within a very small volume, whereas the, this irregular person is really all over the place in terms of um, cycle lengths. So the bottom line is regular people have a very regular period, but also their cycle length is quite uh, um, similar to everyone else, and it's uh, centered around 29 days. Irregular people are about 10% of the population that we're analyzing, and their cycle length um, is variable, but also goes from a really strong extreme uh, on both sides of their of um, their peak. So when we do this uh, time series embedding, no, not at the individual level, but we show uh, the whole data set, we find again that the cycle length is um, nicely presented for 90% of the, the population here. And the orange ones are all the irregular um, menstruators. This is exactly the, basically the same, um, the same data, but shown in different ways. When we look at the same question, but this time not looking at cycle lengths, but period lengths, we're finding a different uh, finding, which is that period lengths does not change. Uh, whether you are regular or irregular. So everyone is very nicely uh, centered around uh, here. And that's about, you know, it goes from uh, five, four to five days basically is, is what we're finding here. So, um, so once we have these two different um, populations, basically on one hand, 90% of the population, which we're gonna call the regular ones, and on the other hand, the irregular ones, we started looking at all the symptoms that these people are tracking and looking if there are any question, differences among them. So here are some of the ones that ended up being uh, statistically differently tracked from one population to the next. And we did a lot of, uh, you know, we made, there's a lot of different symptoms and categories of symptoms. So we made sure to, um, to take that into account. But the main finding was that um, people with volatile cycles or irregular uh, menstruators also had volatile symptoms. So it's not so much that, uh, you know, 
the irregular people had heavier flow or lower something or anything like that, but that there were much more many variations in the way they were tracking these symptoms compared to the regular ones. Okay, so I'm gonna skip on this because I wanna um, tell you a little bit more about the prediction, but any question about the characterization? Okay, so I'm gonna move to the prediction then. Um, so what we're gonna do is, remember we said, okay, there's this issue of like, sometimes we can see when someone tracked and it's very obvious, right? Like this, like peak at 30 and 60, and we kind of removed those, so wonderful, but you know, maybe we're not, uh, that's a little drastic to remove those and not others. So we're gonna be doing two things here. We're gonna, try to disentangle the variability of the cycles, but also whether someone has forgotten to track. Okay, so two different variables. Uh, one is we're gonna call the variability and the other is the self-tracking adherence. And um, we're going to look at whether we can predict, um, predict the next cycle. As I said, in this case, we're only gonna be looking at um, um, the cycle length information. So we're not paying attention to any symptoms for now. And we're, what we would like to do because we wanna be kind of user-centered is we could ask ourselves it, at the beginning of a cycle, how long is this cycle going to be? But every day that passes, I kind of have more information, right? Because today I didn't have my period. Maybe today I didn't have my period. When I get to day 14, I still didn't have my period, but maybe I have better understanding of when the next period is going to come. So we wanna be able to update these predictions every day. And finally, we know that there is such a thing as like population wide, wide um, behavior of menstruation, even though there's a lot of variation. Um, and so could we still use some sort of uh, population wide knowledge all the while uh, prioritizing for these individual uh, longitudinal data. Okay, so three, three really char big characteristics to the model we're gonna be trying account for this new explicitly modeled variable, which is I forgot to track uh, a particular cycle, update the prediction every day and utilize population-wide knowledge. So when you say these things, the way we translate it in, is into a graphical model. Um, and so we have uh, every day here, which is observed, and uh, we want to be able to um, train on what we call C or variable C, which is a number of cycles. Um, in our experiment, I think we're doing 10 cycles history, and we want to predict the, the next cycle. So we have enough cycles basically to be able to say, you know, I can see a trend in someone's uh, someone's uh, history. And we present, as we said, these two different uh, variables. One is a cycle pattern, lambda, but also pi, which is, did I forget to track a cycle? Uh, and then we are having a, a hierarchical approach, and that's where we're encoding population-wide information is basically through our hyperparameters out there. So we have um, several versions of this model, in fact, that we looked at uh, each in these two different papers, the one in Jamian, the one in machine learning for healthcare. But that's basically all I'm going to say about the, the model, and I want to focus on, the, on our finding. So the probability, this pi here, this probability of skipping a, a, um, a cycle, I'm showing it to you here to show you how it evolves and how it could be used for us in, in why it's nice to have it be used uh, in an explicit fashion. So this is uh, as I'm going through my day. So here I'm on day zero. That means I, had, I have a history of C cycle and I'm asking how long is going to be the next cycle. Uh, and as I keep going through the days, um, there's no reason to, for this to change. We still don't know. We still don't know. We get closer to maybe someone who, um, you know, for this particular user, someone who's quite regular maybe. Uh, and, you know, the closer we get to what we expect the cycle lengths to be, but there's still no uh, cycle, 
then we uh, start upping this probability. And if it goes uh, way high, then we can start saying, okay, something is really not like it should be for this particular user. And so we could, um, we could do something about it. What could we do? We could literally send a notification to the user and say, you should really, you know, we really expected you to start um, tracking, but you haven't tracked today. So could you be, um, could you track? So in a way, we're using this model. We could be using this model to um, decide when to send a notification, which is kind of nice because exactly like in the electronic health record and decision support systems, alert fatigue is a thing. You can't keep on asking someone, did you have your period today? They're not going to answer to you. But if we're being careful about when we ask this question, we have a chance, a better chance of getting an answer. So, um, so that's why we're excited to have this thing. The second reason we're excited to have this explicitly modeled is that it actually helps us predict better. So how did we see that? We looked at uh, this particular data set. So out of these 380,000, we know uh, further uh, reduced our data set because we're looking for people who have at least 11 cycles tracked. So why did we do 11 cycles tracked? Because the me that was a median number of, of cycles tracked in our data, which is very high. If you think of it, 11, 11 cycles is nearly a year of engagement with a self-tracking app, which is much more than uh, many apps out there. Uh, and so that's good. That's something we're taking advantage of. Uh, these particular people, uh, their age was between was 26 plus or minus three and a half years, which is really based on the fact that we're looking at people within that age range because that's again their stable reproductive uh, life. Um, they really had a mean of 20 cycles. We really only used the first 10 for training and the last one for 11. We truncated everything else afterwards. Um, and we find that for these people, they had uh, 30.5 days of mean and a period length of four plus of minus days. So we, we tried a few models. Proposed model here is um, the model that I showed you. Proposed model with S equals zero is basically the model that I showed you, but ignores the fact that someone we're gonna be, someone could be um, forgetting to track, okay? So we're trying to basically get a sense of how good is our model in general and how much of that is due to our model versus to the fact that we are explicitly uh, modeling for this um, by uh, quantity. And then here we have a bunch of uh, baselines. Some are extremely competitive, such as the mean and median. So out of the 10 cycles of an individual, we could compute a mean cycle length and a median cycle length. Um, we can also um, train a CNN and two type of a sequence-based type of deep learning model, an LSTM and an RNN. And so what we find is that uh, median is not great, but mean is really good. Um, and then the, they're all doing somewhat well, except when we get close to uh, you know, forgetting to track or not forgetting to track. And so the closer we get to someone um, forgetting to track, all of the baselines are unaware of the fact that people are not always good at tracking. And so their RMSC basically becomes unusable. Whereas um, all of the models, the two models that we have are somewhat able to correct for it. And obviously the one that has explicitly says, yes, we think that this person in particular tends to forget to track. Uh, corrects for it even more, and so we have a lower um, RMSC for it. Maybe it doesn't come as a surprise, but it's easy to predict when someone is extremely regular. It's less easy to predict when someone is not regular, and that's what this plot is showing to us. Um, and that's something we would want to work on because obviously we you know, we want to help the user. So if someone is extremely regular, they do not need our help to know that uh, when their next cycle length is. Really, we want to help the irregular uh, users. Um, but, you know, that's 
that's one where history still helps, but it's there's a lot of variation there. Okay, so um, I'm looking at the time. We have a model that we like because it can be, uh, first of all, it, it performs very well. It has minimal input information. So that's a big, a big thing. We are only using it cycle lengths. And why are we doing this? Because most people only track cycle lengths. And so we want to be able to have kind of like a common denominator type of model here. Um, when we account for skip cycles, we get better uh, predictions. And we can also, uh, with our model, we can predict up-to-date uh, predictions day by day. Um, there's one thing that I didn't tell you, which is that um, the way, because of these hyperparameters that we set at the population level, it's kind of nice because we can also have a model that is not fully, um, um, that can basically preserve some privacy about people. Also, we're not making any strong uh, privacy claim here. So would site symptoms help? You know, so we said like most, most users do not track their symptom. Let's not, uh, you know, tell them, no, you can't have any prediction. Let's build a model for that. But for the ones who are uh, tracking their symptoms, is there something that could help? So, you know, it's not 100% sure that they help. In some users, um, when they track the right thing, it does help tremendously. And in others, uh, because they don't track exactly the things that are really much in sync with the variation in the menstrual cycle, it doesn't help us. So how am I showing this to you here? We're doing kind of like lagged correlations between um, your cycle and when did you track a specific symptom? So this is descriptive, it's not predictive at all. But one of the symptoms you can be tracking is called ovulation pain. It's not something that is often tracked, but when it is tracked, it's extremely predictive. I shouldn't say extremely. It's pretty, it could be very easily predictive of uh, the next cycle length or the upcoming cycle, because basically ovulation pain is a pain that occurs at ovulation. And typically your next cycle would start about 50, literally two weeks after ovulation. Um, and so that's that's a nice one. Tender breast, which typically also happens during uh, during ovulation, but also gets um, uh, much more significantly uh, in the period right before um, period. We can see here that for the people who track this particular symptom, again, there's a nice uh, signal of correlation about the same as ovulation time and then the week prior to period. And then here you get, to, we're just looking at a kind of a sanity check that when you do a correlation, an autocorrelation between cycles, you do find across users uh, some sort of, um, of cyclic information basically. So again, the point here is that there could be some uh, models to be built that use symptoms. I think the difficulty is that there's not a lot of symptoms that are heavily correlated with cycle lengths. And the ones that are typically tracked are uh, not for that particular goal are not that common. So it's both a, you know, it's an interesting question, but it's not clear that that's the one that's going to solve the issue for most users. Okay, so uh, I guess my conclusion is that mHealth can be useful in this case uh, in characterizing and predicting a particular health phenomena, but that we're going to need to be uh, careful in uh, presenting and, and mitigating these biases that we can find. And the one uh, factor we focused on in this particular work was the one that people are not always engaged or adherent with tracking data. Um, there's, um, there's some potential for including symptoms, but as I said, it's not, it's not really clear that it's going to help. Uh, and the other thing is that when we have this type of models that are both present, pre predicting two things, the physiological, but also the tracking behavior, we can be able to develop better tools, both in prediction of cycle, but also in having more usable tools out there. So I want to thank, in particular, Kathy, Nigel, and Chris.
and Virginia and Amanda, who are a partner at Clue, as well as the NSF and the NLM, who, are, who have funded this research. And I'll stop here so that we have time for questions. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Owen, no, Amy. Uh, very great talk. Uh, I want to start with a clarification, a clarification question. Maybe I missed it, sorry. Uh, for a user, is that like maybe she's like a regular for a certain period and you know irregular for another certain period, right? And in your data, oh, did you like it for a user can it be both or did you like include both yeah. in the period? So we, um, we don't, yeah, that's a good question. So we don't um, force the data to be regular. We, you know, we, we found these like two groups of people, like the regular and irregular people. Yeah. But in our prediction, we don't really use that. Uh, we just learn from 10, the 10 previous uh, cycles. I will say that it does happen in people. In fact, yeah. we're, we're in, in the process of uh, looking at when would it happen, for example, when there's a pandemic and uh, there's a big stress. And, and so suddenly it would have an impact. There's some right now, a lot of questions about whether vaccine are changing cycle lengths. And that's yeah. also something we would want to look into. Um, mm -hmm. But most of the time it doesn't, it actually doesn't happen. Um, okay, great. Thank you for the answer. Yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, yeah, you can ask. Hi. Um, thank you for such a wonderful talk. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I guess my question is about, so you partnered specifically with this one app and it seems really well suited to do this sort of research. I'm curious, would, would these results be generalizable if a different app were used? Like what are the potential effects that a different app might have, whether on user adherence to reporting or, you know, is there like a selection bias and like the types of users who might gravitate towards one app versus another? Um, and how do you guys plan to, to address that in your analysis? Yeah, yeah. So, so I would say you're right that each type of app attracts different type of users. So we know, for example, in Clues that we have fairly, first of all, it's 12 million people, it's a lot of users, so we know it's going to be heterogeneous, obviously, but um, but there are a lot of younger people, for example. So other apps that have been used in this type of research are things like Natural Cycle, which is a very different, I mean, it's also a menstrual tracker, it's not that different, but uh, it is different because it um, it uses a particular contraception style, which is called natural, and uh, people have more physiological ways of tracking their their cycle, in particular their body temperature. There is a, there is also the availability to track your body temperature in Clue, but we can see it's not heavily used. Um, so, what looking at the related work, like in particular, I'm thinking of the work of Laura Simo at Stanford who has looked at this other type of tracker, we find very similar things in our characterization. Um, but, you know, we did not look at where the bulk of the clue users were, which are between 13 and 21. Uh, and we were sure we're gonna find different results in this case, because we know physiologically that uh, cycle lengths changes drastically. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I see one question from Chonois. Uh, yeah. Can you advise on how to identify sources of variability comprehensively? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the, let's see, how can I say this? Um, comprehensively, it's hard. I think this is where we want to be able to really um, talk with, uh, with the experts at Virginia Witsum is a an expert on menstruation, for example, and she's the one who kind of validated or, or findings like, yes, it's worth it to look at um, a median CLD more than nine days. That makes sense with the literature, etc. So, you know, there are probably other um, sources of variability. We don't, we don't know what they are, I would say. I see Matthew has his hand raised. Yeah. Hi, Matt. yeah, thank you, Noemi. So uh, first, a comment. I think this is amazing work. And I think that in addition to the social stigmatization of menstrual abnormalities, which lead those conditions to be underreported, you have the additional challenge of information loss from the unstructured to structured data in certain types of observational healthcare research. 
And so I think that this app tracking will improve data capture both in this space and possibly other areas of medicine. So I'm really excited to see how this develops. Uh, my question for you is, do you anticipate social determinants of app utilization? And if so, how can they be overcome? Yeah, um, you know, if you're asking within the world of menstrual trackers, um, we, we, and I, when I say we, I really mean as a community of researchers, we haven't seen any big differences from the type of determinants we can get access to. So they basically, and there's only one, which is a country of origin. So we, we know that our data set comes from many different countries. I don't remember how many, but it's in the, you know, it's less than a hundred, more than 50. Um, and they, there doesn't seem to be any difference. We know from uh, surveys uh, outside of menstrual trackers, like uh, the Pure Report and things like that, that uh, use of menstrual trackers is very high. It's the second largest in teenage girls, independently of any social determinants. So we have some elements of answer, but not an in-depth type of, um, of analysis. I see some, hold on, I'm opening my chat. Um, would it be possible to distribute the recording? I don't know, ask Craig. <laughs> yeah, Harry Alford. <laughs> oh wait, beautiful, great. Gamze. Hi, thank you for the talk. Just uh, echoing everyone else, what everyone else said, but I have one question that may not have a mo uh, very scientific motivation. Uh, so, Growing up, what we were told that the our menstrual cycle, the the age that we start having our periods, the age we stop, everything, kind of relates to our biological relatives, mostly biological mothers, right? So I was wondering if that can be used as a baseline for the predictors. For example, if you were to have a cohort with information of their moms and grandmas and their cycle information, maybe. Uh, you can evaluate your predictors if they are good or bad, uh, comparing the results to that. That's one question, uh, but I'm not sure if it's really hereditary, uh, all these uh, things related to period. And if, if so, then why don't we have more genetic data from patients with uh, problems in their menstrual cycles? Yeah, so why don't we have because we don't have it, we should, right? Uh, but I think back to the question specifically of like, hereditary aspects of menstruation, what people have found is actually kind of against hereditary uh, explanations and more about uh, your environment. So um, uh, pollution, air pollution, you know, like these kind of things, like what, how many plastics do you have around you, estrogen disruptors and things like that seem to have a large effect. So anthropologists do a lot of studies where they go like in, you know, one specific area of a country versus another specific area and find drastic differences in literally in estrogen levels even. Um, so the, the population more than the, sorry, the place where you are more than your hereditary aspect um, is explaining variation in cycle lengths. Uh, there's a researcher here, Lauren Houghton at the public school, the public health school that is looking exactly at this question of like, you know, she's looking at immigrants and whether there is connections between the two and she finds that no, there isn't. But all these being said, there's also hereditary in uh, disorders of menstrual cycle. So maybe it doesn't help us to predict the lengths, but it does to some extent um, help predict whether someone is more at risk for PCOS, endometriosis, these kind of things. Thank you. So, Hari, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. We're, we're, we're past the hour, so I apologize. Um, well, uh, so your presentation today is entitled Predictive Modeling for Self-Tracking Apps, a Case Study in Menstrual Health, which leads me to uh, sort of like what the future for this has and its application to other diseases, which maybe uh, ties to Courtney's question. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, you know, we... We have, a, we have one app, obviously, on, on uh, endometriosis fundo, which uh, you guys have heard through the years, uh, where there is the same questions, right, of like how much adherence is there 
um, and it's you know especially in this case with an with an app where the you know which is the case for most chronic diseases where the symptoms you're looking at are much more varied than your next period length there's even more question about when am i going to have a flare or you know is there some cyclical information there that i can take into account so this this idea i think of like detangling the tracking behavior from the physiological behavior is really the crux of what we would like to do in any other um, self-tracking app. Thanks again for the great talk, and we're looking forward to see how it goes in the future. Yeah. Okay. Um, with that being said, I think we can adjourn here. Right. Uh, see you guys next week. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thanks. Thank you.